for a second talk. All right. So um, probably so one of the examples I mentioned was this genetic example, but as a lot of you probably know, a lot of the large-scale data analysis is driven by advertising and internet environments. So we have to slip a product placement in here. So, um, so you know, the foundations depends on you know applied math and statistics and computer science and machine learning and so on. And there's different professional societies that do this sort of thing. And so one of them, SIAM, so Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And so um, SIAM has a new uh, journal on. SIMODS, S-I-M-O-D-S, on mathematics of data science. So um, I'm an editor on this, and there's probably at least a couple other editors, but the lead editor, Tammy Cold, is here also. So if you have any questions about this, um, you know, grab me at the break or grab Tammy with questions or uh, send your papers this way. So um, it's still evolving. It will count as mathematics of data, and how does it fit into this sort of complex landscape? Um, you know, we're talking about, but um, keep this in mind for um, sort of good quality mathematics of data papers that you might be thinking about. What's the acronym? SIMODS, S I M O yeah, M O D S. Oh, okay. All right. Do you know when the, what's the time the turn around? So it's not more than a year or two, but that's because it's less than a year or two old. So there, there's, there, 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 I don't know, what, say six months a year is the goal, and it's evolving to, be, to, to see it. So I don't know, what, is it nine months, six months was the, sort of the, the current goal? Well, the total turnaround, the first review should be back in a few months. Yeah. The referees only take like uh, 30 days, right? Yeah, but that's after the, the six months not doing anything, and, and then Tammy no. pings them three oh, times. Okay. <laughs> so this is going to change that. So, the, so this, this, for the referees here, you have to do something. Okay. So, um, so, 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 you, so six months, nine months is the goal, end to end. Um, what, which, you know, how do you implement that? And so that's tricky, right? Because different areas do things. So that, that's an important consideration. So um, if once you submit your paper and it's not gotten back in time, start screaming. And um, if you scream at me or Tammy or someone, you know, we'll keep the ball moving to the extent possible. Yeah, but that's a fair concern. Michael can testify that I will yell at the editors. You yeah, know, I mean, I think there's a good, I mean, it's evolving and we're trying to figure out how, you know, the, the landscape what goes where. So, yeah. All right, Tammy just looks nice. She's willing to scream or something, right? So, you know, you're, you're saying you're willing to scream at everyone, at the editors and so on. So, yeah, you'll, you'll kick the kick. Uh, yeah, all right. All right. So, on that happy note, okay. <laughs> Run up. Um, all right, so, so I tried to cover sort of the basic ideas. And so the way this, so the sort of theory works in general, and then how you might instantiate it, say you want to do an implementation in LAPAC. The details of how Blend and Pick does stuff is different than the details of how LSRN might do something in a distributed environment, and that's different than the details of how you might do it if you put it in Spark or MPI or on GPUs. And so the core ideas are the same, but they'd implement sort of instantiate in different ways for implementations. If you're interested in an application, there was a question this morning about, um, you know, images versus natural language and pre-processing in different ways. And so, you know, clearly um, there may be a condition number issue or something might be, you know, something easily normalizable in one case and not in the other. Um, and so different, in different areas and use cases, things are going to be very different. Um, but also, even if you just want to sort of condition on theory, you know, things are, are somewhat different. And so how would you use the basic ideas? So we've seen one example with high precision numerical implementations. You know, get a sketch, use it to construct a preconditioner. But since a sketch, you know, sorry, since a preconditioner is used, you know, to define a trade-off point, you know, maybe you don't need a, a full um, subspace embedding. Maybe you could lose a dimension or two and down simple much more aggressively. And so that's an example of how you might use it in, um, in a numerical implementation. And the low rank approximation stuff that I mentioned just briefly at the end, you know, similar issues arise. Uh, matrix completion and systems of linear equations. So these are two examples of problems that um, arise so m most use cases here are sample rows and columns, either in, in the canonical basis or in a randomly rotated basis. And this is more structure when you have the full subspace information, as sort of as a general rule of thumb. Um, if you want to sample elements, you typically need other sorts of structure. And so um, what happens in matrix completion, which is an idealization for users and preferences, is you say, um, I want to make typically pretty strong assumptions that you're low rank and so on, which um, may be useful as a statistical model, but certainly isn't sort of plausible in practice. I mean, there's, there's not k types of people in the world, even if as a statistical modeling 
point that they may, you may want to model that. And so you make pretty strong assumptions. And then you use, and the assumptions are, are you know, something called incoherence. And so the hello world version of incoherence is just that the leverage scores are flat. Um, and it might be a coordinate aligned version of that or those other extensions of that. But some sort of incoherence assumptions. And then you use heavier duty convex optimization methods. And there's been a lot of work on that. Um, Laplacian based linear equations, um, you heard about, I think it was earlier today and probably later in the week. So I have a graph, it's, and it's an adjacency matrix, or it's a Laplacian, which is a related matrix. And sampling um, nodes in the graph, or sampling edges in the graph, what does that mean? And so sampling edges in a, in, in a um, Laplacian is an element of that graph. Um, and that essentially corresponds under the hood to sampling a row from an edge incidence matrix. And if you want to do graph sparsification, sort of the right way to do that is to sample based on the leverage scores of the edge incidence matrix. Now you shouldn't call a black box QR solver because the, if, if it's a million node graph with 10 million edges, the edge incidence matrix is a million by 10 million matrix with two non-zeros per row. And so you don't want to be densifying. There's a lot of reasons why you don't want to do that. Um, and so what you need to do is come up with some notion of leverage or sens sensitivity or influence that one is algorithmically tractable and two will do something you want. And so what is done there, you're, they relate it to random spanning trees and, and low stretch spanning trees. And the idea of low stretch spanning trees is you might overestimate the influence or the leverage of any one edge. Um, and so those probabilities will be off, right? You're going to misestimate some of them. But the sum of the overestimates is not too bad. And so depending on the method you use and so on, the sum of the, not the leverages, but the estimates of them is in the letter we had before, not d, but d squared or something. So it's low dimension, it's not high. Well, it's not d squared because in the graph case here, but it's you know, d log squared d or something. And so, um, and so you can use that as a proxy. So there you're not making stronger assumptions, but you're using combinatorial techniques. So very different techniques, but to get an estimate of that. Um, so there's a lot of work in machine learning um, people were interested in so-called kernel-based methods, and I had one slide at the very end that I put up, but there's a lot of work there. Um, Ken mentioned a little, well, I guess he glossed over it at the end, um, on, on kernel-based methods. That was then, this is now, so people want neural networks, but, you know, operationally, there's a pretty substantial theory practice disconnect, and, and if you sort of analyze what different layers are doing, you know, different layers are doing some sort of matrix products, and they filter it in different ways. And so machine learners sort of use these techniques at one step of a 50 layer thing. And so what's going on? So I'm not going to talk about those. I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about sort of some statistical questions and some optimization questions. And this will be in a little bit more detail, a little bit less detail and a little bit more. But the idea is to sort of touch on the same sort of themes I was talking about before, that there's certain structural results. Um, the questions you want to ask, you know, you'll get very different answers. And sort of highlighting some connections there may um, help to clarify some things. Um, so I'll probably spend most of the time on statistics, a little bit on optimization. You heard a little bit about that this morning. And you'll hear first order methods. And you'll hear about second order methods tomorrow. Um, and I'll just point out how these things fit together. And um, a lot of sort of open questions here. If you, if you take a, so there's a foundations of data, theoretical foundations of big data. I think it was, those was run here at Simons five years ago. And so when I was preparing this, I took a step back and said, so what's similar and what's different to then? So that was then, and so this is now. So there's a lot of questions that um, are, are open here, and there's a bunch of hello worlds. But um, I'll try and sort of highlight some things, and hopefully that gives you a flavor of what might be going on um, in the whole space. So there's more information on these slides. We're at 39 of 1,002 or whatever. So um, I'm not going to go through everything in detail, but, but these are available and, and follow up with questions and so on. So statistical approaches. So, you know, I don't know what. So what's statistics and machine learning? And um, if I had a controversial thing to say, I'd say it. But you know, it's one of these things. So let's just say people self-identify in different ways. And so let's say that's sort of what you do. Um, so for us, what's the so th there's differences. Oftentimes, they're cultural and not technical. Um, but those cultural differences you know, are substantial in terms of the way you ask questions. Um, what you think is interesting. I, do you just want to get a better precision recall curve? Or maybe you're designing an experiment when you want to understand something. Um, the differences change with time now versus five years ago versus five years from now. And the two groups interact with, I think, theoretical computer science and randomized linear algebra and these sort of foundational questions in, in rather different ways. And so, um, so um, with that, I'll move on. I mean, we can talk at the happy hour on Thursday more about that if you want. <laughs> 
So a statistical perspective on, um, call it algorithmic leveraging. So statistics samples data from the world. And so there's a lot of stuff on this. And there's been a lot of work on resampling methods. And if you're familiar with this, um, in particular things like the bootstrap and the jackknife. And here, the idea is that you have the computer. Now you can compute lots of stuff. You don't need to write down everything analytically. Um, and so you can compute estimates. And the idea is that if I have this sitting in front of me, the data here, um, maybe I can resample this in a way that makes a statement about the world. And so you resample. Um, and so if I have n data points here, I might resample n things with replacement. But if I do that a thousand times, each of the things I sample is a different instantiation of the world. And if I can understand something about the variability on my thousand samples, I might be able to do some sort of inference. And so, um, so in particular, if I have n things here and I'm sampling n roughly, you know, I'm, I'm doing a very different thing than we've been talking about so far, right? You know, you're not sampling low dimension or rank parameter, you're sampling high dimension. But of course, you're asking a very different question. And so what's the connection? And this is one of those things that you know, takes a while to figure out and the differences are more cultural than technical, but sort of the, uh, sort of, to exaggerate just a little bit, um, the hardest part here sort of is, are you minimizing like AX minus B or sort of X beta minus Y? <laughs> so I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had a conversation and people talk about X and it turns out you're talking about two different X's and then it's clear after an hour Y. And if you're talking with someone from, Greece, you know, and, you know the, is that a B or a beta? And that becomes a beta. So, you know, little things like this where certain things are just sort of obvious um, after a lot of effort. So x beta equals y. And I deliberately am going with different letters now for the next few slides to make things a little uncomfortable if you've never seen this before or comfortable if you've never been familiar with the other notation. So, you know, x beta. So, so you, know, you have a vector. The idea is you have a matrix. This could be random or, or fixed. You know, there's different random design and fixed design. And there's some ground truth, beta naught. And I have some noise process, and I generate y's. And so the question is, I want to, you know, I want to find beta naught, or I want to find an approximate to, approximation to that. And so the answer is this, right? This is your A transpose A inverse sort of thing that we had before. Um, y is, y hat, is a projection matrix of y. So what does what does the hat relate to what we were talking about before? So this, what is this thing? Orthogonal projection onto the column space of x. So this is a complicated way to write an orthogonal projection onto the column space of x, right? So this is h is equal to u u transpose, where u is your q from your qr decomposition, for example, um, or, or from an SVD or from anything. So you, you take your data and you project it down. So that this is the hat matrix because it takes your non-hatted thing and it puts a hat on it. So if you go to statistics books, there's hats there. And so if you have UU transpose and you ask yourself, what is the II element of that? That's the II element of that. And that's equal to the ith row of this tall matrix if I get all my squares right. Um, so this is exactly what we've been talking about. And the reason this is outlying is because when you project down, the diagonal element's large. And you can ask about off-diagonal elements. And, but in the simplest case, so these, this is the leverage or influence of the points. Um, randomly sample some number of constraints. I'm just using different letters, but this is solve the subproblem. So this is just to show you the same thing we saw before with different letters. And the theorem we had before is that if you do that sketch and solve, this isn't preconditioning, this is just to take the sketch and solve, um, that your one plus epsilon, take your approximate solution, plug it in, your one plus epsilon, um, or the solution vectors are you know, up to a condition number, epsilon close. So this is the same thing you had before, just written with different letters. And um, you could ask, you know, I'm constructing this estimate of beta, right? Beta naught is what the world is, and I want to get an approximate version of beta by solving least squares, and that's optimal in certain senses. Or maybe a sketched version of least squares, which might be slightly suboptimal, but might be faster, for instance. And so let's say omega is whatever the <coughs> sketching process might be. Um, you can look at x transpose x, but the sampled version of that, I'd say read through the d's. Sometimes people you know, the, the diagonal rescaling is put inside the S. Sometimes it's not. So just read through the Ds, and, and they're just rescaling factors that could be absorbed into the, into the S, which is your sampling or projection matrix. And so your estimate is, you know, X transpose X, but with some sort of sketching or sampling process in here, times X transpose sampled version of Y. So okay, this, is, this is good. Um, but, you know, how does this depend on the subsampling process? So it depends in a very complicated way, right? In a sort of a nonlinear way. 
So something that um, is 2013 or you know a while ago by now is you can ask yourself sort of a Taylor expansion, and you can expand this around the different places, but in particular around the OLS solution, and get something of this form. So you don't need to parse all this, but just realize there's something of this form minus a residual that in that case we didn't analyze. You could try and analyze it. So the d domain of um, of uh, convergence. Um, Overkills probably where you have a subspace embedding. You could probably get it with something ELS, but I don't know the answer, so I'm going to leave that sort of as open. Um, if you do an expansion like this, and so this is going to tap back into some of the other things. Um, I, I inserted these actually in the wake of this morning. Um, there was a question about half um, leverage or you know, the generalization of leverage and half uniform. Why would you do that? Is that implicit regularization? Is that what's going on? So what we have here is an expansion, and so you can say, how good is this? in comparison to whatever I might care about. So here's an answer. So given this expansion, you can say, what is the expectation? And the expectation could be um, conditional on your y vector, or it could be unconditional, and, and you're going to get two different results. Um, and the expectation in the two cases, you know, the expected value is the OLS solution or the ground truth, plus you know, something. Um, and there's a variance. And so the variance is something of this form. Your x transpose x inverse, x transpose inverse, plus something. And so you have a piece of bread and a piece of bread, and your salami is something in there, right? And so ditto down here. So depending on whether you're conditional or not, you know, you get 1 over pi. And so pi here is a probability. It's a sampling probability. So you get this in the denominator. And you get this for a different reason than you had before, right? You had, what we had before was you're pulling something out, I'm constructing an estimator. Here I'm basically doing an expansion and saying, you know, what is the variance of the estimator that I've constructed? So that's appearing in the denominator. And so I mentioned this and put this in here because if you're asking a CS question, you want to get your subspace embedding. You have that, basically you're done. The rest sort of goes through. Um, and it's not just the case that you don't quite need that for, um, for other, other sorts of questions, right? You know, the iterative least squares. Um, you also need to worry about other things. And so this is the simplest version of that. You need to worry about very small probabilities. So to get the subspace embedding, you need to find the large ones. Deal with the small ones however. You can underestimate them. I mean, it doesn't matter. But since these estimators have this in the denominator, if you're asking a statistical question about the world, not the algorithmic question about the machine, um, you're going to get those probabilities in the denominator. And that could cause a problem. Now, how bad is that problem? We'll get to in a second. But you know, that could cause a problem. Um, so, you know, for any sampling or scaling process, this is leverage or not, this is Gaussian or not, this is, I mean, it could be any range of things. Um, you're going to get conditional or unconditional estimates around the OLS solution of the ground truth. The, the variance is going to depend on the details of the sampling process. Um, and so this is, this is going to hold when the higher order terms are small, they could be large, in which case you have worse problems. If you sample uniformly, the variance is going to scale as n over r. So this is different but, but similar to what we saw before, that if you sample uniformly and ask a worst case question, you're going to have, have bad scaling. Let's say BLEV is just used vanilla leverage. It's going to be low dimension over R, P over R. So if you make R a little bit larger than P, you sample a little bit more than the small dimension, things will be good. Um, if you approximate the leverage, this is empirical fa fact, if you approximate the leverage score sort of in, in any which way you like, call that A-LEV, you get the same things to, to first order. There's very small differences. Um, and let's call S-Lev essentially what you saw this morning. You know, a half leverage, meaning a half bias yourself towards the non-uniformity plus a half uniform. Now, how do you implement that? We had to go to a lot of effort to find these leverage scores. How do you implement half leverage plus half uniform? Of course, that's easy. Right? You just flip a coin. Well, some probably use sample uniformly and some probably use sample in this complicated way. So it's a very simple, simple thing to implement. But you know, you're going to moderate these small terms in the denominator because you can't have levered, you, you can't have those terms be too small because now I'm sampling with a spectral probability that can't be too, too small because I'm, you know, it's, it's half uniform. And what you'll see this is the bias, this is a variance. As a function of alpha going between 0 and 1, you know, you can get a sweet spot. And so you saw a half this morning in this particular setup, it's 0.7. So um, the prediction, if you ask, Never mind optimization, iterations, the simplest possible question is it a, how would this perform in least squares? Ask vanilla least squares. Look at an expansion around sort of the solution. Um, and you know, what if I sample spec to leverage? And, and you do worse. But if you admix in a little bit of something that's very easy to admix in, you'll do better. 
And so this is in the straightforward least squares case. You, you can see that similar things like this in low rank approximation, and you heard this morning about sort of the version of this in, in a first order stochastic optimization problem. So um, this is a relatively simple fix, but it's an example of a structure that, that's a little bit more fine scale that you might want to capture. That, um, Does what, this mix in uniform or something else? This alpha is, um, I might have alpha one minus alpha backwards, but it's, um, it's, it's leverage plus alpha, you know, one minus leverage, one minus alpha leverage plus alpha uniform. uniform okay. So just, it makes a little bit of uniform. You could have mixed all this stuff. In this particular setup, it didn't matter. You could use row norms, whatever. But, you know, it, it mixes in a little bit of something else, actually, and, and that buys a lot, yeah. And so this is a regular, I mean, it's, it's not a regularization on the final solution. It's an implicit regularization at an intermediate step. So someone this morning asked about that. So, you know, essentially that's what's, what you're doing. You're hedging against very small things. Um, and, and you know, correcting that a little bit. And this decreases the variance of the estimator. This decreases the variance of the estimator in that expansion, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a bias. I mean, maybe you could relate it to a bias on the solution vector. We didn't know one looked at that, but it decreases the variance on the solution vector, yeah. Um, so that's one thing. That's from a few years ago, actually. I wanted to slip this in because um, an open problem there that, you know, I, one of these thorns in your side is we did this Taylor expansion, but you know, we never, it was a little bit hand wavy, you never quantified that. So, how do you, how do you, how would you might want to quantify that? And this gets to the question is the objectives we we're looking at earlier the things we want, or should there be some other objective? And we know the answer, right? It depends. It depends. <laughs> so, we need a microphone over. It depends. So, it, so, what's the objective you should look at? So, if we're interested in understanding the effect of the sampling process, this Taylor expansion was a nice hello world to illustrate in a very simple context a range of, range of trade offs. But, um, and I, I'm not going to find where I had it. Um, this depends on the subsampling in a very sort of complicated way, a very non uniform way. And so, something that's, not, that's sort of common in statistics when you have more complicated subsampling estimators like that is to say not how does a sum sample perform on fixed end, but take an asymptotic limit and, and gain some insight there. So here we have beta hat, I've made things bold, but um, is the estimator we had before, and there's two parts of the randomness. One is in Y, and that's randomness in the data. One is in W, that's randomness in the algorithm. And so how do they interact? Um, and in particular, the randomness in the algorithm is entering in this sort of nonlinear way. And so take a page from um, asymptotic statistics and say, um, ask how would this, can we get some sort of asymptotic distribution as, as n goes to infinity. Um, so now there's a couple subtleties. It's easy to take a limit that makes everything trivial. So talk to me offline if you want to avoid that. But if you're not careful, you can take, you know, if you fix n and let p go to infinity or vice versa, it's easy to homogenize things too much. You've got to be a little bit careful. I'm going to gloss over that here. Um, we're going to look at a, at a maximum likely, well, I mean, a, an example of asymptotic analysis is, is, is a maximum likelihood estimator. So there's no explicit form here, and so you may take an asymptotic limit and ask about the asymptotic uh, MSE, for example. So the mean squared error, this is just a way to write mean squared error, which is bias plus variance um, in, in terms, so you have the, the T be an estimator and, um, uh, and for, for a parameter vector nu, this is the way to write down an MSE. Either you've seen it or you haven't, but don't parse all the letters. If you haven't, it, that, that is it. You could ask the asymptotic version of that. So put an A here and you know, do an asymptotic version of that. And so I'm not going to go through the, all the details here, but you can get an asymptotic uh, mean square error and an asymptotic sort of variance covariance matrix and expectation. If you do that in the setting of asking the question, what's the effect of the sampling on this prediction, um, you can show uh, the following. So under sort of assumptions that I think are reasonable, but th there could be interesting questions about coming up with a more reasonable set of assumptions um, in the sense that it's, it's, as I said, it's actually hard to get a nice set of assumptions that don't render things trivial. So I think there's a, sort of interesting follow-ups here. But under sort of a reasonable set of assumptions, um, then as n goes to infinity, we're going to get something of this form. So if you've seen asymptotic statistics, you may recognize that. If you haven't, don't worry. Um, we're going to get something slightly different than we had before. And I think it's on the next, yeah. And so um, this, this is the usual sort of asymptotic normality claim. You're going to be asymptotically normal. Um, so in particular, in unconditional inference, and you know, if the, if the predictors are diverging and you're conditional, you, there's a more complicated version of this, um, beta tittle is asymptotically unbiased estimator of beta naught. 
and the asymptotic variance covariance matrix is given in, in this form. So I've glossed over some of the details of what the particular um, equations tech, you know, meant to uh, mean. Um, because I want to say, you know, here's something. We can go into more detail later if you're interested. Here's something. How would this manifest itself in anything we've been talking about? So what do we care about? Do we care about the, the solution vector in this you know, notation beta before x, you know, the actual solution vector? Do we care about the objective, which is something related to x times beta, maybe minus the residual? Do we want to feed this into a correlation um, matrix estimation or something, in which case it might be x transpose x times beta. And so depending on which of those, and, and from everything we've been talking about before, they're the same. Get your, get your embedding um, and, and it, it'll go through. Um, if you're asking this sort of question, if you want to estimate beta, these in fact are the optimal probabilities not for the MSE but for the asymptotic MSE. If you want to estimate x beta, which is y, these will be the optimal probabilities. So here is x transpose x inverse. This is x, x transpose x inverse times you know, xi, which is the square root of the leverage scores. This is something that's um, a little bit more complicated. It has this variance term on the denominator, this correlation term on the denominator. And if you want x transpose x beta, you get something which is not rho norm squared, but rho norm. So which of these do you want to do? And know the answer, right? It's going to depend. So, so there's two points here. One is that um, things are simpler or harder. There's a richer array of things you can capture here depending on what you're asking for. But you're also more robust to missing a few things. If you lose one dimension or something, some of the figures I glossed over, you introduce a little bit of bias. That's typically not the dominant term in these empirical results. So you introduce a little bit of bias, you may decrease the variance. So things may actually get better if you lose a few dimensions. So. Um, Structural results. So this is this was neat because we were able to relate to something that I knew about but um, didn't know how to relate to these sort of sampling processes, these asymptotic methods, and so that was a nice connection. What about these structural results that we've been talking about? Um, and, and those just, I mean, similar results you can see in low-rank approximation and kernel methods and other things, but, but the simplest sort of setup is in the least squares case. Um, so recall the original problem, beta OLS, I guess I made OLS capital. Um, and so we're doing sketch and solve again. These little details. Some people assume something this, such that that's immediately satisfied, other people don't, so we have something to keep in mind. Um, let's define two things. So the efficiency typically has to do with the ratio of variances. If I have an estimator and I have another <laughs> estimator, that has better variance, same means and better variance properties, this one's better. And so ask about the relative um, efficiency. And in particular, let's say for a prediction problem where I look at the difference between the beta vectors filtered through x, maybe in, in expectation, um, for the sampled version minus the OLS version. And you can also ask about a, a different estimator, you know, residual efficiency. So take my solution, plug it back in, and look at y minus x beta from the sketch, or y minus x beta from the OLS. So these are sort of very um, statistical objectives in terms of efficiency. Um, there's an expectation here. How does that expectation relate to what we've been talking about? Um, so there's no sort of natural correspondence with sort of an algorithmic approach. I mean, to, to write things formally, you could say, well, define y in terms of x with a linear model where essentially, you know, you just look at the, you know, the, the error is any vector that lies in the null space of x. So that's sort of the closest correspondence, in which case you'll get some sort of worst case error metric like this, which is the first cousin of what we've been talking about, where there's a supremum, not an expectation. So these letters are almost the same we had on the previous slide, except there's a supremum here instead of an, an expectation. Um, so again, you know, which of these do you want? And it, it really depends on sort of the use case. Um, let me, in the interest of time, say, you know, if you're interested in the worst case estimator, you'll get an estimate 1 plus a supremum of something like this. I'm not asking you to parse this. That's a spectral norm. That's a subspace embedding. You have the norm here, but you can make that unit length if you wanted. Um, plus something on how that interacts with the, with the projection matrix on the sample. 
If you're interested in a statistical setting, you'll get something similar, but instead of having a spectral norm here, you'll have a Frobenius norm. Again, boiling down to matrix multiplication result, but a Frobenius now rather than a spectral norm. Um, which do you want? And so that's going to depend really on, on the particular use case. Um, ditto with, the, I mean, with both notions of statistical error. So um, we talked before about how the basic least squares result for just doing the linear algebraic projection boiled down to that structural lemma that had two pieces. I mean, here you'll have something similar. I, you know, let's say alpha is a parameter that says how close is this to one or you know, away from above zero. Um, I could have another parameter that corresponds to what's the connection between the error, which could be a, a Gaussian random variable anywhere or could be adversarially chosen perpendicular to the column space, and something else about a Frobenius norm. So the interesting thing here that was one of the questions in the last section that Fred came up and asked me afterwards is, we're relating the low rank approximations to a bunch of matrix multiplication results. Why don't you just put an identity somewhere and tear it apart instead of the obvious way? And you could do that, but you're not going to get the very fine scale relative error bounds you would, because if you do that, you're going to have a mass, the, the norm of a matrix and a norm that depends on a high dimension, because you have a Frobenius norm, you have a sampling. So this thing might not be high dimension, but it's high dimension minus low dimension dotting into an orthogonal matrix. And so it's going to depend, be a high dimensional factor. Um, and so this is going to be related to why in a lot of the statistical objectives you need the sampling complexity to be much higher. Um, I don't know if I have it here, but I want to mention it if I don't. Um, everything, so the sampling complexity being much higher is actually a problem, not just in, in two ways. One, if you want to get high precision solutions, you need to couple it with an iterative numerical method. Um, also, if you want, are interested in, in essentially statistical objectives, and um, for two sort of slightly different reasons, but both can be taken care of if you sort of consider iterative techniques. Um, and so the iterative techniques will be a little bit different. Um, so if, if I'm just interested in the basic least squares problem, you, know, you could say I have AX minus B. Um, the solution, you know, is the pseudo inverse of A times B. This is X opt. Um, and I'm going to have X tittle opt is um, the sampled version of A pseudo inverted times the sampled version of B. Um, and you saw the results you got before, right? You had the 1 over epsilon squared in the denominator, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You could say, you know, B may have error, right? Because B is x beta minus y. And we know that y is equal to x beta plus noise. And so, you know, fix this, you know, hypothesize that. You just put a bunch of error there, and so y has gobs of error, right? Now you're downsampling on it. And so is that going to cause problems? The answer is it could. It's not going to have problems if you're interested in the objective on the data in front of you. But if you're in, interested in the world, you know, you may have problems. Um, so why don't you do the following? And make sure I get my letters right. So now I'm going to mix letters. Why don't I do it to be consistent with what I have there? To say x transpose x beta minus or equals x transpose y. This is the normal equations, right? Um, don't sample there. You're going to do a, a matrix vector product there, just deal with that, that separately, but that's not going to be a pain point for the iterative algorithm. And put, you know, sampled version of x transpose, sampled version of x beta is equal to x transpose y. And then call an iterative algorithm. And so um, you could do that. And so I actually taught a class a few years ago, and Mert Polanchi followed up and said, why don't you do such and such? And it, so this is, I think it's called Hessian sketch. And so you can use this. Um, that'll, that's uh, you know, of interest potentially for the least squares problem in a certain corner case. But it's nice because you can apply it to a range of other convex optimization questions. And you can you know, ask about first order methods or second order methods, and probably some of the second order methods you hear about tomorrow will use variants of this sort of technique, essentially approximating the Hessian and how well do you approximate the Hessian. Um, so yeah, so there it's, it's not, I don't know what you call this. This isn't sketch and solve, but this is sketch part of and solve and then iterate and sketch part of. It. So um, we'll have to think of an acronym for that, but you could do that. And that actually grew out of this particular, the, and, and so in particular, the fact that you need, the sampling is going to depend on the high dimension, you can get around by iterating in that way. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but you can get around that um, in that way. Um, and again, a bunch of empirical conclusions I'm going to gloss over a little bit of the theory. 
Um, empirical results are actually very consistent with the theory. Um, getting good statistical results, if you're asking statistical or machine learning questions, can be easier or harder. I mean, it's, it's incomparable. In some ways, it's easier. You can cut corners. In other ways, it's harder because you're asking sort of different and harder questions. And I think the trade-offs are just very different than you'd, you'd see if you're asking um, numerical questions or, or, or sort of worst case algorithmic questions. So a lot of sort of open questions there. Um, you see it here in least squares. I like least squares because it's simple. You saw this this morning. You saw this this morning in, in, in a stochastic first order optimization algorithm. You can solve the first problem. You can iterate. You can quantify it in terms of condition number trade-offs. So a lot of these themes you'd see in more complicated versions. Um, something that was sort of cute. Say you're solving a ridge regression problem. There's sampling, there's noise in the data, there's noise in the algorithm. How do they relate? So the min risk of classical sketch, min risk of optimal solution. So here's a regularization parameters, the x-axis, y-axis is, is uh, risk and down is good. Um, similar for the, the Hessian sketch. The point is that the values of the regularization parameter are very different, right? And so this is ridge regression, right? This is, I don't know who did, you know, this is, when was this done? This isn't Gauss and Hotelling, but this must be 1950 or something, right? So the simplest possible thing you can imagine, analyze it, ask how would you choose that, you know, how would you choose that regularization parameter? And not surprisingly, it just hadn't been pointed out before, if you have noise in the data and you have noise in the algorithm, they're going to interact in certain ways and you can over-regularize, you can under-regularize. And so this is ridge regression. What if I tack on a non-linearity and a convolutional layer and wrap this up with 50 things, you know, talking to each other? The way stochastic optimization, first order methods and second order methods work is you heard this point, you over-parameterize, you drive the error to zero, and then you have 50 knobs you fiddle with to get things right. One of the knobs will do this, two, the other knob will do this, the other knob, so the, all, all the knobs will do something like this in very complicated ways. And so this is a nice example to see just in a very simple setting how noise in the data interact with noise in the algorithm, right? So noise in the algorithm, what's your batch size? What's your learning rate? You know, are you doing stochastic first order? Are you approximating the Hessian in second order? And so there's a lot of knobs here that feed into that. And even in the simplest setting, we can see this, never mind some of the more complicated settings. So it's really hard to think about those neural network applications in terms of something like this because there's so many moving parts and, and the convex theory really sort of disconnected from, in a lot of cases, sort of how they'd actually appear in practice. And so this is a nice sort of playground to understand how the implicit regularization behaves with noise in the data. Um, connection with bootstrapping. Let me gloss over in the interest of time and just say, so I mentioned bootstrapping as a technique to uh, estimate parameters if, if you, you, know, you resample data, um, but you're asking an inferential question. I want to know how well I, I can make an inferential claim. Um, how, so, so how does that relate to what we're talking about? You know, there's a world, and then you get a copy of the data and you put it on your machine which might be 150 machines if, if you have your distributed data center or something. And then you put it on your sample, which is your RAM or whatever, and then you chew on it, right? You're making an objective here. A, 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 uh, a, you know, the one plus epsilon bounds we saw before make a statement about how the sample talks to the machine. Bootstrapping makes some claim about how um, the particular sample you have today might relate to the sample you get tomorrow, you know, from, from, from the distribution from the world. Can you couple the two together? So it's sort of a hello world result that does it not in the way of chaining those together, but saying, you know, if I want to get beyond sort of a worst case error, a priori bound, could I use the sample that I construct, do bootstrapping on that to get a better estimate of the number of samples I need to? And the idea is that if I have a sample, I can look at the variability in that sample to get an estimate of what the variability would look like in the full data set. So I'm, I'm glossing over the details in the last few slides, but the short answer is yes. So this will be sort of a, a way to parameterize algorithms in terms of properties of the data. Numerical analysts have asked questions about um, coming up with a posterior or I uh, sort of condition number estimators or, or estimates. Um, so think of this as sort of a statistical analog of this. Um, this is a trade-off space here. These computations are very highly scalable. You can do them in parallel and so on. So, um, um, there's a bunch of hello world results. Nice theory in terms of estimating extreme, you know, extreme value processes um, that was not black box, at least in, in terms of any sort of anything we knew. 
Um, and so, um, and the numerical sort of performance is encouraging. So um, that's sort of a whirlwind of a few sort of statistical methods. And um, just to say, now, you know, relative to some number of years ago, I think things are sort of maturing. And even in a sort of a relatively simple context, you can ask questions that are analogous to in much more complicated convex, not convex optimization problems and understand these sort of trade-offs um, for sort of foundations of algorithms. Um, let me mention two other things, just sort of how some first order and second order ideas um, in terms of optimization might relate to what we've been talking about. But maybe I'll pause for a second, see if anyone had any questions um, on, I guess, this number six, this bullet, is it, if there's any questions. Well, this one that what bootstrapping really means. Can you explain that quickly? Yeah, I don't know what the hi you mean. How it's done, or what's the hi what's the name mean? I don't know the name, the historical. Um, so, I want to make an inference. I want to make a prediction about the world. Um, I have some data here. Um, I could come back tomorrow and draw the same data. Of course, in a lot of cases, I can't because. A lot of people had to die to you know, cancer trials or something. So you might not be able to, but you, know, you could come back tomorrow. Um, and so do this a thousand times, but then three years is up. And so, so you might not want to say, come back tomorrow many, many times. You might just want to say, I have one copy of the data. You know, what can you do? And so what you could do here, if this, I mean, so this is going to oversimplify, but if the data set size is n, construct a sample of size n um, or comparable to n from this data, but sample uniformly and with replacement. So if you sample uniformly and with replacement, you don't get everything. Right, coupon collecting says you're going to need n log n to touch everything. So you get, what's the number? Is it 63% or something? So you get 63% of the samples. And of course, you've sampled some things multiple times. And so now you have a data set. So this is D. But when you've done that, now I have D1. Of course, I could have D2, D3. I could do this a thousand times, and I could do this in parallel on a thousand machines. So if computation is relatively cheap, I could look at these things, and I could construct estimators from this. I'm going to get something you know, that behaves like this as a function of number of samples or, or as of whatever, and you know, look at the 99th percentile of this distribution, and then under assumptions and in the right limits, that will correspond to something here, and so I can make inference about what I'll see tomorrow based on resampling here. Yeah. All right, so here's optimization in a slide. Um, so I'll do less justice to it than you heard this morning. But um, So optimization is a funny space, right? And I feel like it's a little bit more complicated even than just vanilla least squares, right? And, and there's a lot going on in a, in a straightforward low rank approximation problem. So optimization seems sort of there's more moving parts. Um, in terms of, you know, what's the objective you care about? Do you care about this objective? Do you want high precision? Are you doing number of iterations as an expense per iteration? Which of those things is expensive or cheap? And then a lot of machine learning applications, you say, well, we really don't want this objective. We want this other one. But then you say, well, in fact, we've over-parameterized it. So we do want that objective, but we have a lot of knobs. And so we're going to, and so it's, it's a little bit, so, so there's a lot of moving parts. So, so think. Um, how might this relate to what we've been talking about? So you could take a step back and ask a more general question, but how might this relate to what we've been talking about? So roughly, you know, you're at a point and, you know, there's this first, so, so what's the distinction between first order methods and second order methods? So sometimes people say the distinction is one looks at the gradient and one looks at the Hessian. Um, is, that, is that, you know, if that's the case, where does LBFGS sit? I mean, so. Um, the simple story is first order methods will look at gradient information and second order methods will look at Hessian information. But the, the full story is a lot more textured than that. And I think people, people have a tendency to like first order methods um, for a range of technical and not technical reasons. But one of the reasons is they're just sort of simple, right? You have a million dimensional function and you can draw something with one or two dimensions here and everyone sort of knows what it means to roll downhill. Hessian's is a little bit more subtle, right? A second order information says, well, there's a trade-off between how far I step and you know, where I turn, right? Maybe I could take a small step here or a much larger step in this direction. And so the, the curvature on that surface is, is a sort of a just much more subtle thing. And I think that you know, 
that's a vector. It's just a bunch of numbers that you put in a row or a column, right? This is a matrix. This is just sort of a much more complicated object. So I think thinking about this stuff's harder. And so I think people don't do it now. People have done it a lot in scientific computing. Um, so a lot of people said, well, we're going to work with first order methods. And one way to think about first order methods is there's sort of oracle access to a gradient, in which case that's, that's the hard distinction between the two. Um, it's not clear that's sort of the most natural distinction as a practical matter if you were to implement things. Um, so those comments aside, and, and we can talk later in more detail about that, think of first order methods as computing a gradient or some approximation to it and then moving a step in that direction. And think of second order methods as doing the same thing, except they say, because um, this is the same, right? This is just the, the gradient. But they say, well, rather than just moving a step in that direction, they say, you know, is there a natural way to step? And they say a natural way to step is related to this inverse of the Hessian. But of course, you should never think of computing that inverse of the Hessian, right? Because you never would, right? You might approximate the solution. You might do an iterative algorithm. There's lots of things you might do, but you'd never actually compute that. And so you'd say, well, rather than taking a step here, I'm going to rotate and stretch and rotate. And that's the right direction to move in. And so there's going to be a trade-off here. How expensive is it to implement something that approximates this versus just move in this direction? And I think what happens a lot in machine learning is you try and approximate this given just gradient access or given very noisy gradient access or given noisy gradient access with a few other knobs. And so what's, the, what's sort of going on here? So with first order methods, so from the perspective, so this is a longer topic we can talk about later. I'll be around, of course, the whole term if people are interested. From the perspective of what we're talking about here, we wanted to ask the question, you know, both of these things sample in some way and solve some problem. And what might the connection between them be? So SGD is sort of a vanilla first order method. You get a you know, noisy version of a gradient. Um, it's widely used in practice because of its scalability and so on. It works on convex problems, but it's also just a procedure. You just run it. I mean, the theory is for the convex case, the 99% use case, and then people apply it to other objectives. But um, you know, so you can apply it to anything. Um, you get theoretical statements that are very different than we've been talking about here yesterday in particular. This morning, you're hearing a little bit about most of theoretical computer science and randomized linear algebra that grew up out of that make statements of the form, if I run so many steps, stop, I'm epsilon good. All right? That's very different than saying, I don't know how long it takes to get here, but once I get here, I'm going to converge at some rate, which is the form of the statement that you get in a lot of optimization algorithms, you know, convergence rate. And the, and the two are just sort of incomparable. And it may be formulated in terms of differential assumptions and so on. So for randomized linear algebra, you get better worst case guarantees, but you know, for, for a more narrow class of problems. Um, and so it's typically formulated in, in either a numerical style or, or a theory of algorithm style. And so the question is, could you combine the two? And this is one of those things that um, it holds more generally. We actually ask the question in the context of least absolute deviations regression, because if you ask it for just a pure linear algebra problem, um, you, you can't beat core linear algebra methods. And if you ask it for a fully general convex problem, you know, just vanilla matrix methods have nothing to say. So think about it in terms of a least absolute deviation regression, which is sort of a nice sweet spot between the two. I or at least, I, yeah. In the previous slide, you said that the, the SGD results were only asymptotic. What about Rachel's results today? She said convergence rate. She did, so, so she no, said, said, I'm going to converge at this rate. I go from one iteration to the next, I get however much better. But she doesn't say, how, how good am I on the first step? So it takes some length of time to get near an optimum. But once you're near it, you know, you'll convert at some rate. I thought she had this many steps got you one step one. Relative to where she started. Okay. Are you going to go more into local and global convergence issues tomorrow? Yeah. So. Um, in people in theory of algorithms use these sort of techniques sometimes, but it's typically for more combinatorial problems where you can bound things related to the width of, of, of the initial set. And so you can say for worst case inputs, I converge at some rate, which is different than saying, you know, I'm going to converge when I'm near the solution or something. So, yeah. So think of this as least squares, but you put a one here or a p-norm there, and it's, it's a more general class of problems. And this is one of these things that took a while to figure out. And then once we figured it out, someone said, yeah, obviously. But I had talked to them six months before, and, and they didn't tell me that at the time. So um, 
So where's the randomness here? Is it in the noise or is it in the algorithm? So least squares and least absolute deviations, these are deterministic problems. There's no randomness. Um, you can take, and this holds more generally, but you can take a deterministic problem. A is your matrix. U is, think of it as a nice basis for the span of A. We're nice in the L2 sense as an orthogonal matrix, and it's a generalization of that in L1 and in other cases. Um, and you can relate it to a stochastic optimization problem, which is the expectation of a random variable drawn, some from dis some from drawn from some distribution of h, where h is an estimator. All right. Um, so this connection is more general than what we're talking about here. But in particular, relate a deterministic um, optimization problem to a stochastic optimization problem. And then ask, how do you solve a stochastic optimization problem? And to summarize a semester worth of stochastic optimization, I mean, there's a couple approaches. Um, it's a somewhat confusing set of names, SA and SAA. So stochastic optimization, which essentially says start with some initial point, iteratively solve the objective, and at each, at each step of the iteration, get a new sample point. If you do mini batches, you get 10 new sample points, drawn from some distribution, and the current uh, weight is updated. You move in the gradient direction with some step size and so on. You can do SAA, sample average approximation, which is go in, pull some stuff out, you know, solve. So sketch and, sketch and solve. Sample endpoints from a distribution and solve this following, call it empirical risk minimization. We wouldn't call it that in theory of algorithms, we'd call it that in machine learning, but solve it empirical risk min you know, Pull a sample out, solve the subproblem. And so which of these is better or worse? They're, they're incomparable, they're gonna be different, right? They'll, you get some um, differences. So to solve the stochastic optimization problem, how do you sample? SA or SAA? Which probability distribution do you sample? Is it uniform or not? Which basis did you use? I said it's a nice basis. How nice is nice? You know, you're doing preconditioning or not. Which solver to use? So in a lot of these things, if we say sketch and solve, how do we solve the subproblem? Maybe we solved it with an SGD algorithm, and I didn't tell you that. Meaning I had a low precision solution. Maybe I solved it to high precision. So um, you can do this, and depending on the decisions you make, sort of vanilla SGD, you know, is online, naive, batch, fast. If you do batch with some fancy way, you're going to get randomized linear algebra, and there's a trade-off point in between. So this is a hello world. Um, and so, you know, the paper needs to get published. We're better on some certain corner cases. I'm glad to talk offline about that. I think the interesting thing is it's set up a way to say there's a few steps. How are you de generating data? Is this at that step, or is this at that step? Are you tying the two together? Um, um, which basis do you use and which probabilities do you use? And then how do you solve? You solve something exactly approximate. So there's two ways to view this. One is that I'm going to use randomized linear algebra to get a good initial point. So this burn-in phase on SGD where I can't say anything and then I converge, I'm going to use randomized linear algebra to get a good point. Why do I know it's a good point? Because I get a subspace embedding. I'm epsilon good or epsilon's a half, so I have some sense of how close I am, iterate and drive that to zero. Or I could say, well, I'm just doing ra randomized linear algebra, um, and at each step, rather than calling a solver that's good to machine precision, I get a very low quality solution from an SGD. And so which of those two you prefer depends on what you prefer, but th this does both of those things, and, and they're two sides of the same coin. Um, So second order methods. So I'll treat second order methods even more cursorily than first order methods, partly because you'll get a couple hours of that tomorrow. Um, second order optimization. So if you're solving convex problems, things are relatively simple. You want to get here you know, to the, the minimum. There's a question about you know, if there's curvature in different directions. And so you know, they gotta, there's a condition number, and there's a Lipschitz constant. And so, so you've got to be a little bit careful. Um, if you're, if you're wanting to apply first order, but in particular second order methods, to not convex problems, you have to ask, you know, when I run out of steam and the algorithm stops, what did I find? Because first order methods looking at just derivative information find, the thing they actually find, you come with very different guarantees than, than you would with second order methods. So um, a notion of optimality for second order methods is I want to be second order optimal. I want the gradient to be zero. I want the gradient to be zero, meaning I'm flat. Just calculus 101. I want the gradient to be zero. 
and if I want to be um, positive, so you know, I want um, I want to find a minimum, so I want the curvature to be up. So I want all the eigenvalues. I want the curvature, the second derivative, to be, to be uh, positive. Um, say the norm of the gradient is zero, but it's not zero; it's just very small. And say that the, for, say that the um, Hessian, the second derivatives, it's not all that all the eigenvalues are positive, but you know they're small; they're more than negative epsilon h, negative, you know, more than something very small and negative, more than negative 0.1. Now this could be 0.1 or this could be 10 to the minus 10. Ditto with this, right? And you can imagine that the sort of questions you'd ask might be very different in those two cases. So um, there is a question about, and, and a lot of people I think spend time saying, you know, this most recent version of, of an optimization algorithm is better because I have a trade-off point between epsilon g and epsilon h and, it, you know, epsilon g to the negative 3 halves and epsilon h to the negative 17 40 thirds or something. And I think that's the way these things are used much less useful than asking about the dimensional dependence and, and sort of modularizing the question of can I get a good solver in a preconditioning sense from sort of what's the structural result that's giving me that. Because if you understand that structural result you can use it in a bunch of other ways just like we saw with, with least squares. Um, so to increase efficiency you want to use gradient, Hessian, um, and inexact solutions of the underlying subproblems. So this is an interesting thing if you're in computational math that's um, indirectly done by a lot of machine learners and people, but not explicitly, and sort of highlighting this in a way we've sort of done analogously with the linear algebra might be nice. Um, so at least what I tell people is if, if someone says I can't do a second order method because I have to invert a Hessian, you should sort of walk out of the room and say, you know, why, why would you think you'd have to invert a Hessian? And the example is every linear algebra book starts out by saying we want to solve y equals ax. The solution is x is equal to a inverse y. All right, they do that on page one. And then they, he just cringed. You guys didn't see this, but he just cringed. <laughs> and then they spend, literally, they spend the next 499 pages saying why you don't do that. Okay. And so similarly here. So you'd never invert a Hessian. You want to get the solution to a linear equation. How are you going to do it? So look at the details of the inexact solutions. So I'm not going to go into details of that today. I think you'll probably hear more about that tomorrow. Um, you can imagine there's differences between epsilon g's and epsilon h's. Let me gloss over that and say, you know, a basic structural result is if sg, subsample size to estimate my gradient, is something, if sh, the subsample size to estimate the Hessian, is something, then condition one, which hopefully is right above here, maybe it's on the previous page, condition one is a goodness condition, um, holds. So condition one is going to be. Did I mess up my numbers? Did I lose one? Oh, condition one is condition. I want my um, gradient Hessian information to be well approximated. So if I sample enough, why is that? That's because this is an, appro you know, this is an approximate matrix product. It's the del vector dotted into an all ones vector maybe, and this is an approximate matrix matrix product. So how would you use that in an iterative algorithm? So it's simpler to talk about it in, in the non-convex case because it's moving parts and it highlights certain things. So this trust region and cubic regularization method that I won't describe them in detail. There's a lot of work in machine learning that says I want to get iteration complexity and I want bounds of the following form. Hessian minus approximate either in general or dotted into the particular direction I'm moving is less than something, a half or whatever, times the norm of this step squared. All right. So, so if you're familiar with optimization, this is stronger than the dennis mori condition, which is this. Um, it's convenient because you have a squared there, so a lot of things will become convenient, but stronger than that condition. Um, and so Fred Roost and Peng Zhu have examples where you can relax that um, to a statement where the matrix matrix product is approximated in the same way, but to finer scale, epsilon times a norm rather than a norm squared. So two things. One, this allows you to just take a bunch of the ideas from randomized linear algebra and matrix sketching, whether you like leverage or not, et cetera, et cetera, feed it into convex and non-convex optimization, whether it's a straightforward convex or trust region and cubic regularization type not convex. So it's not obvious whether just removing a squared, this is buried deep in a proof, does that matter? And the answer is yes. I mean, one, quasi-Newton, a bunch of other things people use in practice don't satisfy this. So you're developing theory that sort of doesn't characterize a broad class of methods, it, it does satisfy this. 
Two, you're able to just take a large body of sketching and sampling theory and, um, and apply it back. So that's a five minute summary of maybe something you hear about for two hours. So that's a little bit oversimplified, but that's, that's the idea. And so you identify a structural result, got to get the scale right, and then you can start to port the sketching ideas. Should you use sampling or should you use projections? Should you use Hadamard or should you count sketch? Should you use any of those or should you use um, norm sampling or leverage score sampling? It depends. It depends, right? <laughs> so what does it depend on? It depends on the condition number. It depends on the aspect ratio. It depends on all these moving parts. And so, um, so I think you know, asking that question, formulating it that way, you open up the doors for you know, a whole bunch of things. You saw some examples of this when Rachel was talking about um, you know, looking at the, at the condition number there, and that's a variant of this. So it really depends. If something's uniform for her and the data have been pre-processed in the image case where everything's sort of similar, do it one way. If things are very different in scale in terms of the natural language applications, do it basically a different way. So um, whichever one you prefer, you run with that, and these will be in more details in tomorrow's talk. So with that, let me wrap up. Um, a lot of this stuff is at the center of a lot of these foundations of data questions, but a relatively simpler setting. Um, but <coughs> learning algebra was used to model these matrices, but also feeds into a lot of these other problems. Um, and randomness, you know, can be used in the data, in the algorithm, and in a range of ways that sort of toggle between the two. So with that, let me um, wrap up, and I guess we'll call it a day unless there's any questions. Questions for Michael?